So thank you and welcome. I'm very glad to be with you here tonight. This is a topic that I'm really passionate about and I'm continually learning about. And actually every time I do this presentation, something else gets added because I'm learning something new. And I, I want to learn from you too, because I know you are all inspiring families as well. So at the end, I hope we can talk about that. So I want to talk about inspired families and nurturing children's spirituality. And um, because I think it's something we don't talk about very much, or if we do, we tend to think about just having family worship and there's so much more to it than that. So at the beginning, I just want you to think for yourself um, when you're sharing your faith with a child, what do you most want them to know about God and his love? And if we were here together in a room having a seminar, then I would share these verses into small groups and say, what from this verse, from this passage, would you most want to share with your children to help them understand God's love? And we'd look at those passages and think about more because the more we think about God and who he is and what we want to share with our children intentionally, then that really helps us to focus on what we want to um, inspire our children with. So this text also inspires me. We love because God loves us. And the start of all our inspiration for inspiring our families and sharing God's love with them is um, that God loves us first. You know, Jesus said, um, love God and love others. And before that, we have to know that God loves us. And I think this is the starting place for every parent, every family to come and just be filled up completely with God's love for us. We need to know his unconditional love for us. And we might need to do some work on that if we don't fully feel that. And um, because we want to pass on this incredible love to our children, but we can only pass that on when we have experienced it from God himself. So what would you most like your child to know and experience about God's love? And I just wrote down a few things that I wanted my children to experience. And this isn't um, limited to what I've written here. I think every day we can learn something new about God's love that we want to share with our children. And keeping that freshness alive, experiencing God's love, and then finding out how do we pass that on to our children makes what we have to share real and vibrant. Um, so I want my children to know that his love is far greater than we can ever imagine. And his love is not dependent on what I do or don't do, that he is incredibly gracious and forgiving, that he makes our sins disappear forever. We don't have to keep feeling guilty for them. I also want them to understand that he is kind towards us. His loving kindness in his thoughts towards us is really important. He cares about everything we are experiencing. He notices every tear we cry and wants to comfort us. He's very close to us. He loves us so much, he's making a place in heaven for us. And he wants us to follow his way because he knows that's where we'll be safest and where we'll find most joy and, and love. So um, what I most want my child to experience are all these things about God's love and who he is as part of our inspired family. And it starts with us. You know, something uh, about being a parent myself taught me so much more about God's love for me. And we need to reflect on that as we are parents. We need to nurture our own relationship with God so we can nurture our child's relationship. The more we experience God's love for ourselves, the more we can share it with his children, the more it's part of our everyday lives and our everyday conversations with us. And I think it's really important for us to find what nourishes us spiritually. Because sometimes we have been told, you know, it's having your devotions in the morning, doing the Sabbath school lesson, reading this book and that book. And, and sometimes that doesn't work for us and we can feel um, guilty or frustrated or not doing enough if we 
don't follow the pattern that we feel is being presented to us. And actually, we are all different. We, we tick in different ways and different things inspire us. And it's important to explore and find what um, kind of devotional life and spiritual nurture do you need? What works best for you so that you, um, you want to be um, doing that activity? You want to be learning about God every day in whichever way is best for your learning style, your personality, your life. And so it starts with us growing our relationship with God in the best way possible. Spiritually nurturing parents have all sorts of qualities and they have this growing relationship with Jesus that keeps on growing. It's not stagnant, it's fresh. Um, they show love and patience and forgiveness to each other as parents when mistakes are made because that is a good model for our children. They learn how to love, how to be patient with others, how to forgive others, and that when we make mistakes, we can be forgiven. We need to be living out positive Christian values. And last time I spoke about Christian character strengths. And those are things we need to be growing in our own lives so we can nurture them in our children's lives and be an example. We need to have close, encouraging and supportive relationships with our children so that we model something, a small thing of God's love for us. His love is so enormous, we can't be expected to fulfill all of that in our children's lives. But through us, they can taste and see and feel what God's love is like. We also need to be able to talk about our everyday faith experiences with our children, to be part of our conversation, how we are growing in our faith, what our experiences of God are in ways they can understand and that, that are appropriate for them at that age. And look for opportunities to help our children grow their relationship with God so they, they can stand on their own two feet spiritually. They, they know how to talk to God, to, to um, uh, experience him in their life every day. So spiritually nurturing parents also pray for their children, obviously. And we need to be open to the Holy Spirit's leading because the Holy Spirit can lead us to do interesting things with our children, to say things that are just right in that moment to help them learn. And so by being open to the Holy Spirit, we can find these special times that we can um, touch their faith and help it to grow and to spark their delight and enthusiasm and wonder. And also to live out 1 Corinthians 13 love in, in the best way we can. Of course, no parent is perfect. We make mistakes. And that's also how we show children that um, when, when they make mistakes, they can be forgiven, they are still loved. And that's an important part of this process. So the parents' relationship, if there is a, a family with both parents, the children see something of God's love acted out in the space between their parents in that love relationship. And the experience of marriage relationship also helps them to understand Christ's relationship with the church as they grow older. And our marriage, our relationships in the family can help our children learn about Jesus's sacrificial, committed, forgiving, serving love in action between two loving adults so that spreads into the children and they can learn from that too as part of the family. So what do children need when we're nurturing their spirituality? Um, they need to know how much God loves them. For me, that is the very first thing, that they need to feel loved by God so they fall in love with him. They need to understand that Jesus died to save them from their sins. They don't have to carry any guilt. They, they are completely forgiven um, because Jesus loves us so much. To learn how to serve others kindly and generously as Jesus did. To be encouraged to develop their character strengths. To grow their own personal relationship with God. To find out how do they do that? How do they spend time with God and discover him for themselves? They need to enjoy family worship. The value Genesis study showed that when family worship was fun and enjoyable, that's what really inspired children and, and kept them in the faith and staying in the, in the church and finding the joy in it for themselves. They need to feel loved and happy and to, to learn through 
all their senses because they are very multi-sensory. They need to learn about spirituality through the way they move their bodies and, and learn and through action. So they participate in the spiritual experience. They need to learn how to pray, to talk to God about anything, to experience answer prayer and actually unanswered prayer. And how do we help them on the process of understanding when the prayers aren't answered the way they're expecting them to be answered? How do we talk to them about, about suffering and disappointment that also happens when we follow Jesus? We're not immune to those things, but we need to help our children to grow resilience in their faith, to understand how these things work together to help us grow in different ways. So something that inspires me about nurturing children's spirituality are these verses in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And that's what God is telling the parents. Love me with all your heart and soul and strength, and then you will be able to pass this on to the next generation. And these commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. They're to be written inside of you, so much a part of the way you live. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. <clears throat> But most of this is about talking, talking about these things when we sit at home, when we walk along the road, when we lie down, when we get up. This is something that permeates the whole of our life. We need to be able to talk to our children about the spiritual things that are happening around them all the time. <clears throat> so how does God teach his people? I'm, I'm inspired by God because when he teaches his people, um, and especially through the wilderness, through the sanctuary services and the different feasts that he gave them, they are so visual, they are so multi-sensory. They are interactive learning experiences for the whole community. The children would get involved in building the tabernacles in preparing the food in being participating in the ceremonies and culture of their lives. And God uses these multi-sensory visual ways to help people learn all through the Bible. Um, he used visions and activities when communicating with the patriarchs and the prophets. And Jesus used parables, which is visual storytelling. And his whole life, how he interacted with people, taught them about God's love. So it's not just about hearing words, reading words. It's something that touches every part of our being. It's important to understand how our children learn because most children don't learn well by listening and reading until they're about 12. Most of them would prefer to learn seeing something visual, being involved in something practical and multi-sensory. And even only about 30% of adults really learn best verbally by hearing and seeing words. Most adults also like to see pictures or do something to, um, to learn from. And so we need to be aware of how children learn best and also be aware of how our children learn. We had three children um, and when they were growing up, we discovered that the first one was a very verbal learner. She loves to read and to write and that was her thing. The next one was extremely visual and he needed to see things and he was always looking for new things to see. And the last one was very multi-sensory and kinesthetic, very active in his learning. So we had to accommodate all these different learning styles when we were nurturing our children's faith. So whenever we want to teach a child, it's not just what we want to share with them, it's discovering how do they prefer to learn. And we can see this by watching them closely, see how they learn the best, see what activities they gravitate towards, move towards, choose, and to see what kind of teaching works best for them so that we can use that to inspire us and guide us uh, in the way that we lead and teach our children. 
So in Deuteronomy 6, um, the message is there about, you know, everyday moments, really. Talk to your children through everything you are doing. All through the day, there are opportunities to share your faith with your children. And this is something that I think we need to take hold of more and understand how these everyday moments can be so very significant. Often the best times to share God with our children are in their teachable moments and they can be in all kinds of places. They can be when we suddenly see a sunset or a rainbow or a life experience happens that we need to talk about. There is sadness and grief or we're helping somebody, whatever it is that we are doing in our life, they are moments that we can help um, share God with our children, set an example to them, show them love, inspire them. So we can help them to engage with nature, to slow down and really be filled with wonder and astonishment at God's creation. Because so many children rush past the incredible wonders that take place all around. And so stopping and experiencing wonder with children at even the simplest things, even how a snail moves, or even how a piece of grass is constructed, can help us to help them to marvel at the details of God's loving creation. We can also talk to them about character strengths that we learned about in the last seminar and identify them in different news stories that we're hearing. And um, when we hear about a leader, you know, what are their character strengths and, and their weaknesses? What can we learn about the consequences of their choices and decisions? And even people in the films and the stories that our children watch and read, um, we can ask them too, you know, who was the kindest person in the story? Um, what values did they have? What happened when they made that choice that wasn't so good? What can we learn from that? So even these things around us can be used to help us open up useful conversations with our children and ask them questions and get them to start thinking. So we also need to find everyday opportunities to show our children God's love through us through the tangible interaction with loving, caring parents, they learn about how God loves them. And so being there to comfort them in their sadnesses, not just to say, oh, stop crying, shut up. You know, let's comfort them the way God comforts us. He comforts us, the Bible says, so that we can comfort others and especially our children. And to show them grace, there's nothing so powerful as a child expecting to be told off or punished and the parent shows them grace. That is such a powerful experience of God's forgiveness in their life when we can do that. So when we forgive them, we help them to understand God's forgiveness and we can also teach them <clears throat> how to forgive others. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's important, I think, also for parents to ask forgiveness from their children. Many parents don't want to do this. They feel it will put them in a position of weakness. But actually, when we say sorry to our children and we apologize for the mistakes we have made and we ask them for forgiveness, we model to them very powerfully that uh, what it means to forgive, what it means to apologize, and they can learn from our example how to ask for forgiveness, how to be given forgiveness. And so we need to make the most of those moments and not, um, not present a perfect picture of who we are, but one who is willing to be humble and admit mistakes to our children and experience forgiveness. Another important aspect of nurturing our children's spirituality is talking to children about our own faith journey. The crisis we've had, maybe with teenagers and older young people, the crises, the questions, the challenges we had, how we worked through them, um, how our character has changed over the years, answered prayers and unanswered prayers when appropriate. They need to um, experience faith through our story. As part of my MA in leadership, I had to write the story of my life with God and how God had been in my life from birth until now. 
And it was very powerful doing that, to go through my life in that way. And I think actually every parent can do that because as you go through your own life story, you develop, you remember the stories you can share with your children about how God has led you, how he's guided you through the ups, the downs, the tragedies, everything and helped you to make sense of the messes and maybe there's some messes you're still in the middle of that you can't make sense of but you know one day they will make sense and we need to be real and honest with our children about the ups and downs of our faith journey so that when they hit a rough patch they know they can remember we went through that this is what helped us and they can hang on through the tough times too we need to help them make sense of life and faith. And it's a challenging world to do that in. Our children are given so much information which conflicts with their faith at times. So we need to have good conversations with them. We need to get good research and good theology to inform us so that when children ask us the big questions, we have some good, big, strong answers to, to help them um, in that journey. They will hear plenty of secular perspectives and we need to balance that with reliable spiritual perspectives that make sense to them. That might not be what we've heard from our parents. Um, it may be we need to discover something new to pass on to them because what our parents told us is now we realize is quite inadequate in the world in which we live. And we need to help them see that the big picture of everything is that God is love and he is looking for the best possible way to show us his love. And so helping them to see the big picture of God's story and how they fit into that is, is very important. It's also important to check in with our children. We can make big assumptions about what they understand about God and, and how they understand spiritual things. And sometimes in their heads, they have a completely different idea than we think they have for all sorts of reasons. So it's important to talk to our children and get them to tell us what they are seeing about God, what they are learning, how they understand things in their way. And that will help us to notice if they're a bit off here and there, a bit unbalanced, so we can gently help them to explore it and find a more balanced picture of God. If we're not checking in with them, and talking to them about these things, then we can let things, um, we don't know what's going unbalanced in their heads and what perspectives they have, which might be completely different to what we think it is. So by being able to talk together, we can clarify things and understand where they're at. And I cannot really stress enough this, being able to have all these different spiritual conversations with our children. <coughs> because these are conversations we have all through the day from morning till night that can help them to grow in their faith. And we do have family worship as well. That can, that can happen for sure, it's important. And I'll talk about that in a while, but it needs to happen in the context of this all through our life, um, all through our relationships kind of experience of God, because then family worship is in a more meaningful context um, you can have family worship and completely put your children off God in the way that that's done. Um, but when we live our lives spiritually, transparently with our children, and they can see us growing and learning as they grow and learn, and, and we can talk together about spiritual things, then something richer happens and we can help them explore God in more ways than the, you know, the, the Bible stories that they're experiencing in their Sabbath school or whatever. So we also need to make opportunities for our children to have their own relationship with God, to talk to God about the everyday things around them, to help them know they can talk to him at any time about anything. And he longs to hear what they want to say to him, whether it's a gratitude chat or praying for an ambulance as it goes by and the people in it, praising God for a beautiful sunset. Just, just be able to talk to God and pray to him at any moment together as a family or on their own, in their hearts. Um, just opening up that idea that we can talk to God anytime, wherever we are. 
and they need to have times of quietness too, when they can just listen for God. Because lives can be very busy and it's good for them to have still time, quiet time, as it is for us. We need to be able to go with the flow of our children. They have different spiritual interests at different times, different questions about God that suddenly come up in their mind that they want to explore. They may have different passions for the needy people in the world and the other issues like the environment or, or something else. And we need to learn to go with their flow support them in their spiritual exploration where they are in their journey developmentally, um, where they are in their interest, their curiosity, and follow their flow. Because when what we do spiritually engages with their interest, their curiosity, their flow, then that's a good, a good connection there. We also need to help them discover what their spiritual gifts are and to find their own unique areas of ministry. Because whatever they do, however small, that can be their special thing for God. And we need to help them discover what that might be. There are some really useful questions that we can ask. So even if all of that that I just shared seems quite complex, um, it's in the handout, there's just different ways that we can open up conversations and opportunities to talk about spirituality with our children. But there are some interesting questions that some families I have spoken to have found really useful. I know one family and they will ask every day of even their quite small children, where did you see Jesus today? And every person will share where they saw Jesus today in whatever that meant. It could be in a squirrel up a tree, it could be in an act of kindness someone did, where did you see God today? And I wonder where you saw Jesus today as well, if I asked you that right now, where did you see Jesus today? And the thing is, when we ask children this question regularly, it changes the way they look at the world. Because when I say, where did you see Jesus today? And they know I'm going to ask that every night when we have dinner together, then throughout the day, they're going to be thinking, what will I say tonight? Where is Jesus? Where will I see him in action around me today in different ways? And they might not know what to say at the beginning, but they will learn from what you say and what the other people in the family say. And whatever they say is okay, because we can see Jesus in, in all kinds of places. What do you most want to thank God for today? That might be a bit easier because it's really important to um, help our children to, to give thanks to God. You know, God is giving us thousands of gifts every day and most of them we don't even notice. We just take them for granted because they're always there. But you know, tomorrow it might not be. And we need to really be uh, thankful for so many things. Um, so what do they most want to thank God for today is an important question. Um, and to help them have this attitude of gratitude towards what God is doing and providing for them all around. What character strength did you use today? And what character strength did you notice other people using? Now this makes more sense if you were at my last webinar when we talked about character strengths and how to nurture them in children by focusing on them, encouraging them, noticing when they use a character strength and telling them that was kind, that was brave, that was persevering, that was really wise. So identifying their character strength and focusing on it is important and, and helping them to notice the character strengths that they were practicing is really important too. What character strength did you see other people using? And what did they do that was so kind or brave or whatever? Because that then helps them to look at others, to, to notice what others are doing well, to perhaps encourage them and maybe get ideas for how they could do those things as well. It's also very important, I believe, to do Romans 12, 15 together. So what was the happiest moment in your day? And let's just celebrate together 
rejoice together as Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice. It's so important to celebrate those happy moments. And also what was the saddest moment of your day? Be sad together, hug them and pray for them and comfort them in their sadness. It's quite important, I think, for children's well-being to be able to express their happiest and saddest or most challenging moment of the day, um, because it helps you to hear their sadness and comfort them. It helps you to understand what brings them joy. And so you get fresh insights into their life, into their mind. You can um, engage with them in the relationship, in your rejoicing and in your comforting. And, and that's really important in the relationship. So, so if we can share our faith all through the day and the way we interact and talk with our children, you might wonder, well, why would we even have family worship? We can do so much in these everyday conversations. And I think it's really important to, um, to build on that web of everyday spiritual conversations when we're having family worship. I think those everyday spiritual conversations, that, that's actually where most of the learning, the nurture, the inspiration can happen. Um, but it's also really good to have family worship times together. So I'm not saying don't have them, by all means do. But if you are doing those everyday spiritual conversations well, you are doing a really good thing, a really powerful thing for your children. Um, so why have family worship? And here are some ideas that people have shared and that um, we can all identify with. To build a child's loving, trusting, obeying and worshipping relationship with God. That's the most important thing. They build a loving, trusting, obeying, worshipping, wondering relationship with God. To help them learn how to pray and to experience some answer prayer, it's important for them to experience that prayers do get answered. They're very simple prayers. You know, please help me to find this. And they find it. It might be a simple prayer. And you might think, oh, they would have found it anyway. But it's quite important for children to have those answers. Um, but also how to, as I said before, deal with the ones that don't get answered. How do we talk about the things when people don't get better and things don't happen when they prayed for them, how do we talk about that with them as well? Because I feel that many adults, when they become um, adult as Christians, don't often know how to deal with the suffering, the tragedies, the unexpected, um, the troughs in their spiritual life. And we need to equip our children to, to do all of those things as well, so that they have, they're equipped for a strong, faith, life, throughout all the ups and downs that life on earth can bring. We also want to help our children, obviously, learn about the Bible stories, to experience them, reflect on them, to maybe memorize some Bible verses. Not every child likes to learn them and not every child finds it easy, but to have some verses that are special to them, that they can, that comfort them uh, maybe when you're not there, they can hold on to them when they feel afraid and they can encourage them. So some of these verses can be very helpful. It's also important to nurture children's character um, through the family worship and the topics that you use to bring them to Jesus and salvation and help them to make a choice to follow Jesus in their life. To grow closer together as a family. I think family worship adds a an extra dimension to our relationship and, and our closeness when we can be close spiritually as well as in other ways. And to serve God together, uh, find a way that you can minister together to, and pray for others and care for them through your family worship time and share your faith with others. There's so many other ideas as well. And um, so it is important to have these times when we come together as a family and specifically focus on worshiping God together, learning about him together um, and making that time really enjoyable and positive so that children have a very special memory of family worship times. I quite like Ellen White's guidance on, on family worship. Some of this might surprise us. It should be the special object of the heads of the family to make the hour. She doesn't mean a whole hour of worship because she says other things later on 
that tells us that an hour is probably too long. But it's the time of worship should be intensely interesting. By a little thought and careful preparation for this season, when we come into the presence of God, family worship can be made pleasant and will be fraught with results that eternity alone will reveal. Um, and so she says, make it pleasant, do a little thoughtful and careful preparation, make it pleasant, make it intensely interesting. Let the seasons of family worship be what? Short and spirited, she says. So that's not a whole hour for sure. And then she says this, do not let your children or any member of your family dread them because of their tediousness or lack of interest. When a long chapter is read and explained and a long prayer offered, this precious service becomes wearisome and it is a relief when it's over. And I quite like that she says that, you know, even she didn't like long, boring family worships. She felt they should be short and spirited and interesting and, um, and enjoyable. And that's what she is encouraging us to do. So if you're going to have family worship, you know, the first thing in the morning is not always the best time for families. Um, so choose a time that works best for you. It might be snuggled in bed together in the morning. Maybe that does work. It might be around the breakfast table. And if you have family that comes and goes, you can perhaps write something on the breakfast table and people can add to it while they eat as they're coming and going. Actually, for many years, we had family worship in the car on the way to school. Um, we have a captive audience and um, we're all in the car together. We're there for half an hour. And um, for us, that, that worked quite well. After the evening meal, at bedtime, all through the day. So don't feel it's got to be at some particular set time. It needs to be what works for you and it can be different all the time. And it can be all through the day. And if you're doing that all through the day stuff, then if you miss a day or a week for one thing or another, you are doing the positive groundwork every day in those conversations that you're having that are very powerful. So often the best worships take some thought and preparation as even Ellen White said, with a little preparation, you can make this good. And I think that that's something that we did, that we tried to plan more interesting and special family worships for the Sabbath time. So Friday night and, and Sabbath evening, we would do something that was more interactive um, at home, do something creative. And it's important to make this time of faith fun and attractive as the value Genesis has taught us. And, and there's plenty of resources today. There's so much on the internet um, of creative worships. If you go to the TED website and go to Family Ministries, there's a section on there for family spirituality. And there are downloadable placemats with um, interactive questions and activities you can do around the table so that if you you will eat together then you can use this um, placemat to inspire your conversations around the table together but there's also links to more than 50 family worship ideas for free that also take you through the process of learning about spiritual parenting um, about um, making Sabbath a delight, praying with your children, lots of different aspects of spirituality are taught as you work through the worships that are listed there. So if you go there, there are plenty of um, free ideas. And I've written um, two books of 100 ideas of worships and one book of 100 um, prayer ideas and one book of 100 memory verse ideas. So if you get them, you can just mix and match the ideas to make your, your worship experience. So something that's helpful to do with small children is to make a worship box and just put all kinds of things in there for worship that will help you. So you don't have to run around the house and find things at the last minute if you're tired. Um, I had a little um, sneaky trick I did when I was a busy mum and um, I hadn't planned worship as I should have. I would pick up one of my books and even though I've written the books, I can't remember everything that's in them. So I'd pick up the book and I would choose a worship and send the children to run around the house 
and find everything we needed for that worship. So they would go and look for these things everywhere. And while they were looking, I would figure out what we would do with it when they came back. So if I hadn't planned anything, that always got me um, out of a sticky situation because by the time they came back, we were then ready to have worship together. But it's good to be more planning than that, just in case there's something you need to, to buy or to find that the children might not be able to find. So planning is, is really helpful. Um, so we can explore Bible stories together and new stories that your child will really enjoy. Find out what they like, what they're interested in. Wherever possible, use their interest to help you decide what you're going to um, talk about and explore together. And there's so many things you can do to make it interactive. Um, let them dress up, find objects that help tell the story, act out the stories, and try as much as possible to use all five senses while you're telling the story, or as many of them as possible. The importance of this is that whenever children actually move their bodies to experience a story or make the sound effects or um, taste something, see something, smell something, the more parts of their body that they use to experience the story, the more it will stay in their memory. Um, I used to work in a, as an occupational therapist in a clinic for people with brain injuries who had memory problems. And we discovered that the more they um, use their senses and body to experience something, the more likely they would be able to remember it in some way. And so I use that when I'm trying to teach children too. And you can do lots of things with simple stuff like Lego. They can build Bible story scenes with their Lego or their bricks or whatever else they have when they're young. Um, there's something called godly play. And I found this a really interesting experience. A researcher called Rebecca Nye at Cambridge University studied godly play. She was trying to find out what would, was most effective in nurturing the spirituality of children. And she searched all different ways that people were sharing faith with children. And she found that something called godly play was actually the most effective. Um, you can see some of the examples of these stories online on YouTube. I think some of them have been videoed. And basically you tell the story in, in a very simple way with very simple pieces of wood and sand trays, kind of like I had in Sabbath school when I was a child. Um, but even so, even as an adult, I found engaging with a story in a godly play context really spiritually inspiring. So the story would be told and then you ask these four questions, four or five questions, and they don't have right or wrong answers, but they're things that children can talk about, we can talk about together, and we can share the ideas. What do you like best about the story that helps them to... You know, they very quickly know what they like best. It's an easy question to get them warmed up and it helps them to look for the things in the story they enjoy. <clears throat> what is the most important part of the story for you today? So what's the most important part or the most important lesson in the story for you today? Because God is telling us all different things throughout the stories in our lives, different parts of the story are connecting with us. What was the most difficult part of the story for you? What do you find most challenging? Which part of the story is most about you or where are you in the story? And what does this story tell you about God's love? I've adapted some of these slightly from the, the original godly play questions, but they're mostly based on, on those questions. And these are just questions where children can wonder, explore, and they are questions that stimulate their spiritual thinking rather than just saying, you know, how many people were on the ark? And it's just factual and memory. We want to inspire their wondering, their curiosity about the story um, and how it applies to their life and what it tells them about God's love. And then after they've heard the story and they've talked about it, you lay out lots of different craft materials for the children or whoever is there. And you say, now make something to respond to the story. They can write something, they can create something. 
And that space is between them and God. You don't interfere with that as an adult. They make whatever they want. You don't even say, oh, that looks lovely. Oh, that's a, a, because you could shape their response the next time they might want to please you rather than to do what is in that space between them and God. So they make whatever they like and they can keep it in a special box to remind them of that story in the future. And that creative space, that making of something to respond to the story is actually extremely powerful. And you can engage with that as an adult or a child in your own way. So godly play can kind of encompass all sorts of ages because we engage with a story from where we're at and we can share it together and generations together can share their ideas and help to nurture each other's spirituality. So we can have songs and music in worship. Sometimes that works for families. They're more musical than others. Sometimes um, it doesn't work so well, but sing a new song. Go and find some modern contemporary songs that really connect with your child's experience. I'm not quite sure how to relate to Jesus wants me for a sunbeam, for example, although I learned that song as a child. Paul Field is a songwriter for Cliff Richard and he's a Christian who writes some amazing songs for children that are really real, contemporary, fun. And there are other Christian uh, songwriters too. So look for things that are relevant to their life. And you can be more creative with older children. I've mostly focused on younger children in this presentation, but there's other ways that we can use music in worship too. And children can find it hard to pray. So it's helpful to give them some practical, concrete things to do to nurture their prayer and to focus their prayer because it's quite hard for them to pray to someone they have never seen. And so we used to use different ideas like these on the screen to help them um, to find a focus for their prayer. We often did an alphabet prayer of praise going through the alphabet praising God for one of his characteristics or a name of God beginning with each letter of the alphabet or thanking God for things beginning with these different letters. It's really quite handy to have a few worships that you can use when you're really busy, prepare them in advance, stash them away. And then if you have a busy week that's crazy, you have something you can just pick up and use. It might be that you share Sabbath evening worships with other families and take it in turns to plan something that you can do together as a group of families. Um, some churches will um, have worship kits that you can kind of borrow and use for worship and then replenish and take back to church for another family to use next week. And that's quite a helpful way to nurture families to have worships. And you can also memorize Bible verses. The best way to learn a verse is to use something in the verse that um, as, a, as an idea for how you can learn it. So for example, if there's a verse about how you walk along a way, uh, make stepping stones out of cardboard or something with the words on them. So if the way that you are learning it um, somehow fits with the words in the Bible verse, it becomes easier to memorize the, the verse that you're learning and make it really fun. So you can create your own worships. Think about the values you want to convey to your children through this Bible story. Think about how it will engage with them, how you will involve them and make it come alive, make it fun, involve their senses. And think about how will this story help them to grow closer to Jesus, to learn about him, to understand more about his love, to grow their relationship with him. And the big questions are, does this worship experience bring them closer to God? Or does this worship experience drive them further away from God? We need to notice this and, and to use this information to shape what we will do in the future because if it's pushing them away from God, then we need to be really careful and notice what we're doing and choose the things that excite them and bring them closer to God. So I shared all kinds of ideas in the last 45 minutes or so, and this is a huge area. Like there is so much to learn about this area, so much I am continually learning, um, so many new resources for parents in spiritual nurture. 
of children. And so there are, there are things that we can turn to, to use and inspire us. But I'm wondering for you, what new thoughts have you had as I've been speaking? What new ideas have you had about nurturing your family spirituality while I've been talking? And what will you put into practice in your own family? What three things will you take away and do in the next week or two that will make a difference and spiritually nurture your family? So may God bless you and your family as you grow closer to God and to each other. And um, I hope that there's something in what I have just presented that has inspired you, that will grow you so you can pass that on to your children and share your faith with them and inspire them for a relationship with God that will go on forever and ever. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you that you love us so much, that you want to be known by us, that you know us, and you want to have an incredibly close relationship with us so we can experience your love, your grace, your generosity in our lives and relate to you and grow in love to those around us, serve people in the world with kindness. We want to nurture this kind of faith in our children and to help grow their character strengths as they mature in their faith. And I pray that you will inspire each one of us so that we can be the inspired people who inspire others, especially the children in our lives. They may be children or grandchildren or school children that we are teaching, whoever they are. I pray that they will experience more of you through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Karen. So as we said at the beginning, not everybody was there at the start. We, um, the presentation is recorded and it will be um, given to those who would like to have it one more time to watch it or for those who couldn't participate tonight. So, but there may be some other questions at the end. Um, Karen said at the beginning, at the end, you would like to share some questions or ideas. I already saw that in the chat, somebody had a question about spiritual gifts, how to discover them in our children. And Daniel Duda, welcome to our meeting tonight here. Um, he already gave an, an answer, or gave an, an, a link to it. So thank you very much. And Rebecca already shared also the, the presentation that Karen was using. So maybe there are some questions, please um, either write it in the chat or now you have the possibility to just speak, unmute yourself, and then you can answer a question, uh, ask a question. I think we need to end the 